Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Tread Carefully, Examining the Rise in Pedestrian Deaths. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Mary McGuire, Director of Public and Government Affairs at AAA Northeast, and I'm just one of millions of people across the country who has been doing more walking and biking during this pandemic for exercise, for recreation, or simply to get out of the house. I'm sure we can all relate to that. And I know I have plenty of company out there. So this seems to be an ideal time to look at ways in which we can all work together to make our roadways safer for pedestrians, especially with a major snowstorm on our doorstep when many people are forced off sidewalks. The pandemic is changing the landscape of pedestrian deaths and fatalities last year and in 2021, but a new AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety study released 10 days ago revealed that from 2008 to 2019, pedestrian deaths across the country soared 55% from more than 4,100 deaths in 2009 to almost 6,400 deaths in 2018. During that 10 year period, 725 pedestrians in Massachusetts lost their lives and 17,000 were injured with Boston, Springfield, Worcester, New Bedford and Brockton seeing the highest number of fatalities and injuries. During that same time, pedestrian fatalities among those aged 60 to 69 more than doubled over the previous decade. And we'll be hearing about efforts to make walking safer for older pedestrians. This webinar is being recorded and we encourage all of you out there to enter any questions you have into the chat at any time. And we will address those questions with our panel. Speaking of our panel with us this morning to discuss all aspects of pedestrian safety are four speakers who devote much of their time and energy to making the roads safer for all users. Jeff Larson is director of the Office of Grants and Research, Highway Safety Division. Before taking the helm at Highway Safety, Jeff was president of Safe Roads Alliance and helped pass the ban on texting and driving in Massachusetts. Stacy Butel is executive director of Walk Boston and took the post in October of 2019. Stacy joined the organization in 2013 and has worked to expand Walk Boston's reach. She sits on the state's bicycle and pedestrian advisory board and led the launch of the Walk Massachusetts network. Corey Rateau has been a traffic safety officer with the Arlington Mass Police Department for 25 years now and has devoted considerable time and energy to pedestrian safety education. Officer Rateau is a former AAA traffic safety hero. And finally, Jackie DeWolf is Director of Sustainable Mobility for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Working in the Secretary's office, Jackie interfaces between highway, RMV, rail, and transit to improve and expand transportation options for all. Jackie chairs the Massachusetts Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board and co-chairs the Governor's Interagency Trails Team, which works to expand the network of shared use paths. Welcome to all of you, and Jeff, let's start with you. The AAA study covers the 10 years from 2009 to 2018, but Jeff, I know you have some more recent numbers from Massachusetts that you're going to share with us this morning. Yeah, I thought, um, thanks Mary, and um, thanks for, to AAA for, for hosting this uh, this webinar. I think it's a, it's a great event. It's an important thing to talk about. Um, and uh, before I before I get into it, um, I, just, I just thought I would just mention um, one thing, if possible. Um, one of the highway safety professionals uh, who has been working in the Commonwealth for a number of years, Bernie Schipoletti, uh, retired last night out of the Burlington Police Department. And I'd just like to um, to note uh, that moment because Bernie has been such a, a strong uh, safety advocate for the roads for such a long period of time and has done such a great job. So, um, so I want to thank him for his service and all that all that great work that he has done. Um, and we second that at AAA. Absolutely, applause for Bernie. I'm sure he's not on this webinar. This is his first day of retirement, but what a, a great contribution he's made over the years. You're so right. Absolutely, he's just been a great partner, has been more than pleasant to work with, and has really been just a great leader, not only for uh, occupant protection and pedestrians, but just for every, everything related to highway safety. So, uh, so thanks, Bernie. Um, so I thought what I would do, I, I'm not going to take an awful lot of time, but I thought it might be worthwhile for us to look at some of the data in Massachusetts um, that we have seen. So um, the, the national data that AAA had put out showed a fairly dramatic increase. But I think it's important to sort of look at where, where we are in Massachusetts. Now, you, you can see from this chart, when you look at 2020, we're, uh, uh, this uh, 2020 was, is, has been a bit of an aberration for just, uh, just about everything. Um, doesn't, doesn't mean that it's not something that we need to really focus on, um, but we did see in 2020, and those are preliminary numbers, a decrease in the number of pedestrian fatalities in, in the Commonwealth. And when you look at this, 
it looks like there's not like a, a solid trend in terms of the number of fatalities um, for, for us in the Commonwealth. But when we go to the next slide, which looks at the percentage of uh, pedestrians who are killed in the, uh, based on the overall number of fatalities, you've seen from 2016, which is fairly, a fairly significant or a trend going upwards until we reach 2020, which again, a bit of an aberration, um, a, a, an increase in the number of pedestrian fatalities. And you know, it's, it's important to note in the, in the Commonwealth, we are, especially with Boston being, uh, and the Boston metropolitan area being such a highly urbanized center, um, pedestrian activity is, is an important part of our world. Um, we, you know, we, we, I, I think in general, we tend to walk more than they do in other states. Um, it's being, being highly urbanized. So um, doing, um, protecting pedestrians and making sure that uh, our vulnerable users are in a safe space is certainly something that we want to be focusing on, especially as we've seen that, that trend of the percentage of overall fatalities on the increase. You can go to the next slide, Mark, if you could. So this uh, takes a look just at the, the cities uh, or the communities around the Commonwealth and for the last three years where the fatalities have occurred. And it wouldn't, it's not too much of a surprise that the, 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 big, the bigger cities, Boston, Springfield, Worcester, are the places where we have seen the fatalities. But there are, there are a couple of things in there, probably a little bit of a surprise. You know, Dighton, Rehoboth um, are not exactly big towns and they have, there have been some uh, unfortunate events there. Um, but we, so we in the Highway Safety uh, Division, we, we like to look don't like to, but we look at this data um, when we're trying to develop our programs to try to understand where we should be um, looking at our, our funding distribution and where we should be reaching out to uh, police departments to uh, participate in our programs. That's some of the things that we look at when we see data like this come through. Go to the next slide if you could, Mark. So this is where, um, this, this looks at the months of the year where um, fatalities tend to uh, occur. And basically, let, if, if you look at um, those top six, that's October, November, December, January, February, and March, actually the top seven. Those, those are the months where we see the most fatalities um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which I think is, is, is a piece of information that a lot of police departments are not really familiar with. So when we provide funding to departments to do enforcement activities, um, a lot of that enforcement takes place during the summer months, during the months when those bottom five, when at least fatal crashes are not, are not quite as, uh, as, as prevalent. Um, and one of the reasons is, is the police departments will see more people out on the road, um, you know, more pedestrians, more bicyclists, more people out there. And so logically, that's a time when they would um, want to use our funds. And that's also a time when we as a, as a division historically have allotted funds to be used. Um, so one of the things that we are going to be working to do over the next couple of years is to um, shift the timing of when our, our funds in the Highway Safety Division are available to police departments for uh, pedestrian and uh, vulnerable user um, activities so that they can use it specifically during these periods of time when um, the fatal crashes are happening. Um, and I think Mary will, or some of the other folks might be talking about it. This is, this is a time when, when light is not as prevalent. So sunsets earlier, um, the time change happens and the sun goes down an hour earlier still. And that's where we start to see that, um, that these uh, crashes are happening. Um, I think this may be our last slide. Mark, maybe you can go to the next one. Okay, so this, this is basically the same information in chart form. It just shows where um, across the, uh, the calendar year these crashes are happening. Um, and again, I think that this is, this is a piece of information that's really important for us. We need to be out there in front of police departments and making sure that they understand where or when the crashes are happening so that they're allocating their resources to be able to uh, to deal with the, the, the calendar swing that we're seeing here. Um, and I, that should be my last slide. So I will uh, give the rest of my time off to the rest of the folks and I'm happy to answer questions either now or later on. Thanks, Jeff. One quick question I have. So October, November, I understand based on the time change, darkness, all of those kinds of things. February seems like kind of a surprise being at the top there just because I don't picture as many people out walking in February. So any uh, thoughts on the reasons behind that? Well, you still have, you still have, except for 2020, you still have a rush hour. Um, and that rush hour happens in complete darkness morning and the afternoon, or most of it. 
Um, and that's that's when uh, pedestrians are are challenged to be seen. Um, visibility is uh, is not as good, um, and I, that's that's a big reason. But you also have you know events like this are going to be coming here um, this afternoon and tomorrow where uh, you're going to have a lot of snow and sidewalks tends to not be as um, walkable. And what happens in that circumstance is that people go into the streets, um, so you're more likely to be in, in the streets. So I think that has uh, something to do with it as well. But I think it's mostly just a visibility issue um, with darkness. Yeah, that's a really good point. Winter weather forcing people off sidewalks into the streets, which we're going to be seeing a lot of over the next couple of days, I suspect. So, Jeff, thank you very much. I'm going to pass the baton to Stacy Butel. And Stacy, uh, I know you have a lot of uh, numbers and thoughts on this. Uh, are we seeing seeing more people walking during the pandemic? Have you actually documented an increase in people walking and biking? Well, we've absolutely seen an increase in walking uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we don't have the best way or a great way of of uh, counting that or seeing kind of what how that works in terms of actual data. But I think all of us who have been um, looking out our windows as we're working or walking our kids to school or whatever it happens to be have seen more and more people. And I think. My first slide really talks about that because COVID gave us an, a, an opportunity and, and forced us to really rethink the way that we look at streets. Um, as we know, people were moving at, with stay at home orders in place and people commuting less often, really trying to keep room uh, and space for those uh, essential workers to get to their jobs. We looked across the country um, with some uh, students, uh, PhD students at UMass Amherst and really thought about kind of what are the different programs that people are looking at to make space available for people walking and biking and making it safer for them to do so given the vast amounts of concrete and pavement that we were then seeing that wasn't being used that used to be used by cars. So there really started to be a major paradigm shift with how can we use our streets better to accommodate those people walking and biking, right? Never before did we realize that our sidewalks were only five feet wide because now we had to be six feet apart. And so all of a sudden we're finding ourselves walking in the street in order to uh, allow people and provide people those public health guidelines to stay to stay distant. Um, so yes, absolutely that there are more people walking and there were some really innovative ways that I think Jackie will talk about and I'll talk about a little bit um, in a couple other slides about ways that people have adapted streets um, to make them uh, safer and more enjoyable and more vibrant for people um, uh, as, we've, as we've been trying to cope with the pandemic. Um, I wanted to focus on also um, some of the numbers that Jeff brought up. So he mentioned specifically that 20, you know, there's a significant change in the number of people that were killed while walking between 2019 and 2020. Um, you know, in 2019, there were 76 people killed while walking, whereas in 2020, 50. Now, we were pretty happy to see that because given the, and I'll talk a little bit about speeding on the next slide, but one thing I wanted to show you by by showing you these different maps is um, that while the numbers of people killed while walking decreased, the locations of where they were killed were very similar. And that brings us back to um, a basic premise that Walk Boston works on across the state, which is that the built environment is not always friendly to those people walking. So until we really think about ways to improve the sidewalks, make real connections, improve our crossings, and slow traffic down, unfortunately, we're still gonna see people being killed while walking. So I think it's really important to think about um, not only the condition of those people and where they were hit while walking, um, but what was missing? Why were they hit? Um, if, there was a, if there was better lighting during those nighttime situations, would, the, would we be able to avoid that death? So um, keeping that in mind while we're thinking about the statistics is really important. And you'll notice too that yes, um, many of the pedestrian fatalities have been happening in urban uh, centers across the Commonwealth, but also within those neighborhoods, within those urban centers, you will see that there is a disproportionate number of people of color that are hit and killed while walking. And that's not a statistic that we should be overlooking. It's something that we should think um, seriously about and start thinking about ways that we can dedicate those resources to really um, building up those um, infrastructure that has been neglected over the years. You can go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, one of the things that Walk Boston and others were particularly concerned about during COVID was speeding. And uh, Jackie and I were both uh, part of a um, <clears throat> press release that went out um, from MassDOT early on. So there was a dangerous trend that was identified as early as May 
and Massad and others were really starting to urge people driving to slow down. Um, at the time, Massad reported that the rate of fatalities on Massachusetts roadways doubled in April, with even with 50% less traffic recorded on the major highways. 28 individuals died in crashes compared with the month of April in 2019, when there were 27 deaths on the roads in the state. So that's really frightening. Um, there were 335 fatal crashes statewide in Massachusetts in 2020, which is the same number of people that died on Massachusetts roads as in 2019. Clearly the conditions in 2020 were very different than they are in 2019. Um, and I think many of you have probably seen this slide before from the US DOT where it talks about um, speed limits and when you're the, the um, survivability rate when you're getting, if you are hit by a car, goes significantly when you're going 40 miles an hour versus 20 miles an hour. The graphic that's on the uh, lower right of the screen is a graphic that we developed with the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the Mass in Motion program. And people across the state in public health were seeing too, um, and being quite concerned about this trend that uh, drivers were, were driving much more quickly given the fact that there was less traffic and more, more expanses of highway and feeling like you could go faster. So we put together this graphic that could be used in different places across the Commonwealth to really um, illustrate the fact that, you know, times have changed, but speed limits haven't. Um, in addition to speeding, I wanted to cover one thing that um, Mary broke up, brought up as well earlier about older pedestrians and how they're disproportionately killed while walking. And I wish I had the answer as to know why that's the case. Um, we do know that more research needs to happen in here, but let me just give you some details about um, some of the information. The graphic below is um, uh, from Smart Growth America's Dangerous by Design report that was published in 2019. And what they do is SGA calculates uh, what's called a pedestrian death index. And they do that for cities across the country and they also do it for different demographic groups like based on age or race, ethnicity or income. And across the country, the relative pedestrian death rate for older adults that are aged 50 and above is more than a third higher than it is for the general population. And for people 75 years old and up, it's almost as twice as high. So um, it's clear that people age 50 and up, and especially people age 75 and older, are overrepresented over in the deaths involving people walking. So this age group is more likely to experience challenges in seeing and hearing and moving. And we all know as we get older, we're more susceptible to, and we don't recover nearly as quickly as we once did. But if these trends are any indication, we're really not devoting nearly enough attention to kind of the unique needs of the older adults when we're designing our streets. And more and more people are gonna be getting, are going to be walking. Um, it's such a great, um, uh, form of activity for cardiovascular and uh, metabolic conditions. Um, walking for mobility has incredible environment ben environmental benefits, excuse me, as concerns about vehicle emissions and climate change. So we expect to see an increase in older people walking and we really need more research to understand more about that. Um, in addition to, to address equity issues, once again, there are higher rates of older pedestrian in crashes were observed in communities with a higher percentage of older people in minority racial and ethnic groups. And given this strong association between race and residential location, it's possible that this, this disparity is associated with kind of built environment situations as I was describing before. But I don't wanna leave you with you know, such dire and dra uh, difficult statistics. So I wanna talk a little bit about some positive things that have been happening across the state and really across um, the US and the world around thinking about new ways to, to create shared streets and spaces that have really um, benefited us during COVID. Um, with fewer people commuting and leaving their homes, you know, there are these incredible um, sp large spaces where people, we could use them and rethink them. Many people are more out walking. Um, never before, as I mentioned, are we so aware of the fact that our sidewalks are narrow. So many of the large cities across the country have developed different types of safe streets and shared streets or healthy streets programs. Um, in the city of Boston, it was called a healthy streets program. And to help cities and towns in Massachusetts really adapt to these streets, MassDOT created the shared streets and spaces program that provided funds to cities and towns to implement quick build projects, to slow traffic down, to enhance crosswalks, to provide spaces for outdoor dining. Uh, create temporary bike lanes and, and really designate safe walking and biking routes to school. 
and uh, they received 304 applications that were submitted by 279 municipalities. And there was a total of $34 million requested. And I'm sure Jackie's gonna give you more details on the specifics, but I wanted to leave you with some images of some successful projects that have really helped to make walking safer and easier for people during COVID. At Walk Boston, we continue to work with these cities and towns across the Commonwealth to try to make these changes permanent. And I also wanted to just put out one more thing that MassDOT has um, a Winter Streets and Spaces grant program to provide cities and towns with grants to improve plazas, um, support uh, sidewalks, um, and again, safe mobility as we, as we deal with the winter months and add some vibrancy to, to our otherwise um, gray skies that we see today. So again, thanks, uh, Mary, for allowing me to come in, asking me to come and talk a little bit about pedestrian safety and, and pedestrian mobility and uh, look forward to hearing what the others have to say. Thanks so much, Stacey. And it's so great to see those photos of some innovative improvements that have been made uh, recently. Quick question for you about the older pedestrians, because I know that's really emerging as a theme here. Um, I know that in traffic crashes, for example, vehicle crashes, we see uh, a, a higher number of older people dying in crashes because as they get older, they become more frail. Do you think that same uh, statistic or that same finding might apply to pedestrian crashes as well involving older walkers and pedestrians? Uh, I think it's definitely a, uh, a contributing factor, yes. I don't know that it's the only factor. Um, as I mentioned, many people are trying to figure out more often why that's the case, whether it has to do with, again, the built environment of, of where um, older people tend to be living. Like if there's an example, if there's you know an older um, adult facility somewhere where the it, it may be on a large arterial or something that's not, you know, that doesn't have great safety infrastructure. But I, there hasn't been trends that, that I think we can point to that have really given us the specific reason as to why that's happening. Uh, so AAA has a great new resource, by the way, that I want to share before I forget to mention it, and that is uh, a resource called Key Timing, which is aimed towards enhanced mobility uh, for older uh, older drivers. Uh, and uh, the website is AAA.com forward slash Key Timing, and there's some great resources in there related to uh, pedestrian uh, resources as well as uh, senior mobility. So uh, just another resource for uh, folks who are uh, on this webinar. So it's always important to get the uh, perspective of law enforcement. And for that, we turn to Officer Corey Rateau. Corey, take it away. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so basically, I'm going to start uh, by trying to show you the different types of pedestrian crashes that are out there, understanding the types and causes, and basically how you can avoid them, uh, keep yourself safer. So if you, next slide, please, Mark. So according to the Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration, there are 13 types of crashes. Uh, right now, I'm going to concentrate on the 11 that we're most likely going to uh, encounter in a kind of urban uh, you know, setting. The other two that aren't listed involving crossing expressways and miscellaneous things such as internal crashes, uh, intentional crashes, uh, driverless vehicle accidents, uh, things like that, they do happen, but for the most part, I just wanna concentrate on these first 11 as they're most likely going to be the ones that we will encounter for both adults and children. Next slide, please. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the dart out slash dash. And uh, this is when a pedestrian is either ran into the roadway in front of a motorist whose view of the pedestrian was blocked until an instant before the impact, uh, that's the dart out. Uh, or the pedestrian walked or ran into the roadway and was struck by a motorist whose view was not obstructed. So that's the dash. So the dart out can be someone coming out from in between parked cars and the driver did not see the party. Are they and they just ran out often kids chasing a ball could be an example of something like that and the dash could be the view wasn't obstructed but the uh, pedestrian may have stepped off on a roadway uh, without giving the operator enough uh, time to react or the operator could have been speeding as well uh, next slide please uh, the next type of crash is called the multiple threat uh, slash trap pedestrian into the roadway in front of a stop to slow traffic and was struck by a second vehicle in an adjacent lane after becoming trapped in the middle of the roadway. So this is definitely something that you'll find on 
multi-lane roadways uh, as people can step out in the traffic. Uh, if it's a multi-lane uh, trying to cross at a crosswalk or uh, even in between cars and one car stops and the other one uh, in the adjacent lane does not stop for you. Or if traffic is two-way, traffic in one direction may stop and the other one that may not stop uh, and the pedestrian is struck because they uh, got stuck in the roadway. Next slide, please. Next slide, Mark, please. Okay, sorry. That's my, uh, sorry there. Ah, so the next one is, sorry about that, a little technical on my end. Uh, unique mid-block, the pedestrian was struck while crossing the road to or from a unique location. So these uh, three examples that you can have here is going to or from a private residence or mailbox or getting a newspaper. Uh, another one could be kids going out to an ice cream truck or a food truck for adults or anything or stepping out from a parked vehicle uh, and being struck by a car. Next slide, please. Uh, through vehicle at an unsignalized location. So the pedestrian was struck at an unsignalized location or mid-block location. Uh, in this case, it's either the pedestrian or the motorist failed to yield. Uh, if it's the pedestrian, they stepped out in front of the uh, vehicle uh, before it had a time to react and stop. Or uh, if it's the motorist, again, they did think they might not have seen a pedestrian, they may have been speeding uh, and failed to yield. Uh, next slide, please. A uh, next kind of crash is a bus related crash. Uh, this can happen both with uh, children at school buses or even adults at an MBTA bus or whatever your local transit calls it. Uh, you're walking or crossing to a bus stop, waiting in a bus stop, or crossing in front of a bus stop at a uh, bus stop. Now, we do have many laws that cover uh, yielding for school buses, things like that. But um, a lot of times this can happen when uh, the bus is a very large uh, visual obstruction, and they may not be able to see someone who's stepping out uh, in front of a bus, or even in terms of school buses uh, with children that as you may see now that they have the long arm that comes out in front of a school bus to push them farther away, uh, the smaller children, so that they are farther in front of the bus so that they can be seen by the bus driver of the school bus to keep them uh, away so they can see them before uh, any kind of crash can occur. Uh, this can also happen sometimes too with uh, if there's not adequate sidewalks uh, around for the children or the MBTA person will be waiting for the bus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, turning vehicles, the pedestrian was attempting to cross at an intersection driveway or alley and was struck by a vehicle that was turning right or left. Uh, this is something that uh, you can have these kinds of conflicts, especially now as you're seeing uh, some traffic is uh, signaling for pedestrian crosswalk is going to what's called a concurrent phase where uh, turning traffic will have to yield in crossing tra uh, pedestrian traffic has a light to uh, walk while turning traffic has to yield and wait so the pedestrians are clear. Uh, and again, with that happening, you may have those kinds of crashes or maybe a pedestrian may have been stuck in the middle of the street. Motorists may not have seen them. It's uh, one of the things that when I'm going out and teaching pedestrian uh, safety, I always try to tell the people you look left you look right, you look left again, and you also look over your shoulder, uh, your left shoulder, just to make sure that there's no traffic coming behind you that's getting ready to make a turn if you're crossing at an intersection. Uh, next slide, please. So you have your through vehicle at a signalized location. Uh, the pedestrian was struck at a signalized intersection of mid-block location by a vehicle that was traveling straight ahead. So some causes of this type of crash could be the pedestrian could not see the traffic signal might have been blocked a vehicle could have been struck in a crosswalk or something they may not have seen that um, they shouldn't have walked uh, excessive delay to pedestrians prior to getting into the walk interval uh, you know it's flashing don't walk but then they also enter the roadway uh, and of course the obvious is that the motorist ran the red light uh, next slide please Another type of crash is walking along the roadway. The pedestrian was walking or running along the roadway and was struck from the front or from behind. Uh, 
this could go back to some of the things that uh, I think Stacy mentioned, inadequate uh, walking area sidewalks, uh, high vehicle speeds or volumes on the roadway, or even drivers just driving too fast for the uh, speed limit. Uh, when it comes to kids going to school, there may not be an ideal route to school that they're taking as there's no sidewalks or anything, or sometimes they may not have any options. It's very common in, you know, suburban areas. And another one that we get a lot of complaints about, the sidewalks are blocked. Uh, people have long cars, they overhang the sidewalk, kids have to walk around to go around them, or they put their trash barrels on the street and recycling. Uh, things like that can force someone to walk into the roadway when they shouldn't be. Uh, one of the things you always tell people to be proactive about it, when you're walking, you should always walk towards traffic, never have traffic coming behind you. There's actually a state law that incorporates that, and it also helps you to see and react if there's a car coming towards you so that you can respond to the danger. Uh, next one, please. Uh, working and playing in the roadway, vehicle struck a pedestrian who was standing or walking near a disabled vehicle, riding or uh, playing a vehicle that was not a bicycle, uh, walking, um, playing in the roadway or working in the roadway. Uh, we had a panel a few weeks ago where we talked about the slow down move over law. Uh, as you can see that someone working in the roadway, whether it be construction worker, uh, officers directing details, uh, tow truck operators uh, getting struck as they're working in the roadway, then that's where they have to be. Uh, it can also happen in uh, parking lots, driveways, private roads, gas stations, uh, places where kids may congregate and they shouldn't necessarily uh, stop and lay in the roadway. Uh, or they may have been waiting near a curb to uh, cross and you know, they may have been struck. Uh, next slide, please. Non-roadway uh, basically can happen in the parking lots. Pedestrian was standing walking near the roadway edge on the sidewalk, the driveway or alley. Uh, a lot of times uh, you might have vehicles that might be obstructed as they're pulling up to the sidewalk. Again, state law says you're supposed to stop before you cross the sidewalk, but sometimes, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times cars don't always do that. So pedestrians should look for vehicles emerging from alleyways, driveways before crossing them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the final kind of crash I'm going to talk about is a pedestrian was struck by a backing vehicle on the street, in a driveway, on a sidewalk, in a parking lot, or another location. Again, uh, drivers may not necessarily be looking over their shoulder uh, all the time, or even sometimes they may rely too much on their cameras, have blind spots they don't always have. Like I have one car that gives me alerts when there's something in my uh, blind spot or even behind my vehicle and I have another car that doesn't. Uh, so really should be relying on using everything, not just the camera, but looking behind you. And as pedestrian, you should be looking to see if there's a change in the sound of engines in the car, uh, looking for those backup lights, the white lights that come on in the back of the car to alert you that a vehicle may be backing up and uh, to take precautions, make sure you don't get hit. Uh, next few minutes, I just wanna try and talk about uh, some defensive walking, uh, next slide, and pedestrian uh, safety for adults. And basically it's like we spend years talking about defensive driving, uh, people get their license, anticipating what an other driver might do, but we really should be thinking the same way when we're walking, you know, identifying situations that carry a risk of being hit uh, by a car and taking steps to control these situations as much as possible. Next slide. So when you're crossing uh, at intersections, uh, this is where you're supposed to cross the street for the most part, uh, but this is where you need to be extra vigilant as a lot of crashes can happen here. Uh, basically, you should always anticipate if it's a signalized that or even a stop sign that the driver may run the light or go through the stop sign or you know may take a ride on red and might not see you or anything like that. Uh, so basically, don't step off when the light turns green. Most times when you have signal timing, if there's a traffic signal, they have what's called a, a clearance phase, which gives a few seconds after when the light changes before the next phase, such as a crossing phase, may happen to clear any cars out of the intersection. But don't think that this, if you're looking at a traffic signal at the second it turns red, that it's okay to step off because you know vehicles may be running the lights or something like that. Uh, always check what direction the cars are coming from and one of the things you should always try to do is make sure that you can make eye contact 
with the uh, operator of a vehicle before uh, crossing off to either a nod or something like that. Kind of uh, make sure that you see each other and one will stop. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, stepping off the curb, uh, that's when you're at the most dangerous. Uh, make sure that you have enough time for the vehicle that you see, uh, not only for you to react, but for the operator of that vehicle to react. Uh, always just, again, make sure that the driver sees you and acknowledges you. Uh, you might see in the distance that they might be slowing down for you. Uh, try and think that there's a point of no return that if there's uh, no traffic signal and it's a unsignalized crosswalk in the middle of a block that you may take an object maybe about you know 200 feet up the roadway from you and say if they're past that point I will step out into the street I'll let the car go first unless they stop uh, next slide please uh, visual screens uh, Again, that's kind of like when I mentioned about the buses, how they're huge and something may obstruct your view or if you're in a multi-lane roadway and there might be one car may stop for you and the other one doesn't. Uh, basically, what you should do as a pedestrian is when you come to the end of that first car that stopped for you, pause and look to see if there's any other cars coming before just keep going out on the roadway. Uh, you know, if you can see the driver, it doesn't necessarily mean that the driver can see you because again, you're being blocked by that vehicle. And also does that other driver have enough time to stop? I've mentioned this times before that when I was new as a police officer in Arlington, I was driving an unmarked car and I had stopped for a pedestrian at a crosswalk in the center of town. And I was driving an SUV. And just as a pedestrian just kept going across right in front of my vehicle, the car came up on the left side of me and struck that pedestrian while I was there. And so, it was kind of like along that point where one, I pretty much never give out a warning if someone doesn't yield to a pedestrian or crosswalk. And two, that I really started thinking that I got to work on pedestrian safety. Next slide, please. Uh, crossing times at traffic signals. Uh, the walk signal might not provide enough time for you to completely cross the street. Uh, traffic signal timing is very complex. I've only taken one course in it and it's a little hard to understand, but basically, uh, the timing that's set out is there's parameters based on elderly people crossing the roadway and how much time it should take them. Uh, sometimes that does not always work out. Signals may be uh, it's screwed up or there may be an error in it. Uh, damage may happen. Um, again, sometimes it might not have that clearance base uh, put in. We noticed that one time we were, had complaints about a signal being too quickly, uh, changing too quickly. But the main thing also you should really do is if it says don't walk, do not step out into the street. Wait until the next phase. Uh, next slide. Uh, we already talked about backing vehicles earlier. Uh, only other thing that you can do besides looking for those brake lights is, if possible, pick a route that doesn't have you uh, going, uh, walking behind cars that may be backing up. Even in a parking lot, sometimes you may see some lots that they may have like a pedestrian path in between uh, each lane of traffic so that you're not walking into uh, the lanes behind cars. And then my next and final slide is uh, something, again, I mentioned a little bit earlier, take a moment to check again. Uh, both drivers and people, uh, pedestrians can make mistakes. Uh, again, just because it says your turn to go or your turn to walk doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will yield. I try to tell people that crosswalks, traffic signals, there aren't these like magic bubbles that will protect you uh, in terms of a crash. So everybody needs to be vigilant, especially pedestrians, because you are the most vulnerable in this situation. So defensive walking means counting on yourself as the final judge, what's happening. Take that moment, make the eye contact with uh, other drivers, uh, make sure that they see you, uh, make sure that you dress appropriately so that you can be seen is uh, perceptibility and conspicuity. So when you're perceptible, it means that the driver has seen you, but it's better to be more conspicuous. So bright clothing, things like that, so that they can perceive you from farther away. And again, they have time to react and you also have time to see them. So I thank you for your time. Uh, if there's any questions later, please feel free to ask me. 
Corey, thank you so much. So much great practical advice uh, in your presentation. So glad you brought up slow down, move over. I think an overriding theme here is slow down, slow down and scan the road, making eye contact with that driver and backing up. Uh, so critically important. I have a very dear friend whose mother was walking her dog in her neighborhood and her neighbor was in a hurry backing out of his driveway and she was run over and killed. So uh, really important things to consider. Jeff, I know you have a quick comment you want to make before uh, we hear from Jackie. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, Corey, great, great presentation. Um, you know, in that, in that list of the crash types, the one thing that really, uh, well, a couple things that struck me is that the, uh, the built environment uh, is so important in almost all of those uh, crash types, um, which is a great transition to what Jackie is going to be talking about. But it also struck me um, when you were talking about all those, and this this is um, a, a failure on on my part. Is um, one of the things that we have not talked about yet is this issue of distraction um, and the the direct impact of these electronic devices that we all have on pedestrians specifically. Um, and it's and I and I think it may have something to do with the, the fact that we as a society are just like. We're so used to them, they're so ubiquitous, it's so much a part of it, we've just stopped thinking about these as being a big problem for, uh, on the roads in general, but for pedestrians specifically. Um, and and, uh, and we, really, we really need to keep that in mind that these, uh, um, these devices, these distractions are um, such a huge problem. And just, and, and just one, one final thing, I was thinking about it when you were talking about it, um, the um, young people don't all know what that white light on the car means. I, and I, and I re was reminded of this when I was um, teaching my son, who's uh, yet to get his driver's license, um, about sort of backing up. He didn't realize that that white light was, was there an indication of somebody backing up. Um, and it's, it's something that we, as, I mean, Jackie, as you're a parent, now you're going to be teaching children, um, that's something that's going to be really important to say that that white light in the back of the car is an indication that somebody could be backing up. So, sorry, I, it was longer than I intended to go, but uh, great presentation, Corey. Thank no, I, I do, when I uh, do pedestrian safety uh, talks at the schools, I do make sure to mention about the, uh, the white lights being a sign of a car's in reverse, uh, and so that they're aware, especially, you know, as you have kids walking through school parking lot. And definitely also your point about distraction, I'm sorry, I should have brought it up a lot more because it's not only with the drivers that we talk about, you know, put the cell phone down and we have the new laws and everything like that. But there's times and I've seen it and I know they've had problems with it in New York City. Uh, people's heads are buried into their phones as they're just walking along and they're not paying attention. So again, it, it takes effort on both parts. You need to be defensive and vigilant as a pedestrian as well as um, a driver you need to pay more attention yeah 100 percent. you know so when, when that you were talking about sort of people coming out from behind cars i mean that you, you got to be careful of that but that's less of a problem if the driver is not distracted by the device in their vehicle um and that's that's something we all have to constantly remind ourselves but completely agree distraction is a huge problem and it doesn't just have to be the smartphone putting on makeup eating talking to your passengers, whatever it is, um, you know, you got to keep your eyes on the road and keep scanning the road and slow down. So uh, Jackie, that brings us to you and all of the uh, plans and campaigns uh, that MassDOT is involved in. Go ahead and tell us uh, what you are working on. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi, this is Jackie D. Wolf, the Director of Sustainable Mobility uh, for Massachusetts DOT. Um, a lot of people say, what does that mean? I'm in the business of just helping advance our mission of providing more transportation options to more people across the Commonwealth. Um, and when we do, making sure that they are safe um, and comfortable and convenient um, for people um, of all ages and abilities. Uh, so next slide. So I want to um, just stress again that this topic in general is not about them or those people or you know, pedestrians, um, that as we're talking about this topic and continue to need to talk about this topic, um, is that it's literally everyone, um, because every trip involves walking, even if it's just from your car uh, to the shop across the street or from a parking lot to your office. Um, this really impacts every single person. Um, and when we talk about pedestrians um, and walking and Everything I'll talk about today, we're talking about if you're walking with two feet, using a wheelchair, you're in a stroller, you're using a white cane, using a walker, um, really thinking about pedestrian in the broadest sense um, and making sure that 
we keep elevating these issues and we keep making sure um, that it's really about everyone. Uh, next slide. So as a lot of people already noted, um, the built environment impacts um, mobility um, and the choices we have. Um, and sometimes we don't have choices or we're, you know, we need to use certain ways to get around and the built environment directly impacts um, if it's safe, um, if there's connections, if we're forced to walk um, in mixed traffic um, or in a snow event like today, if we have safe places um, to walk um, as well as, as to wait. So taking all of these pictures, um, I want to touch on one new development um, at MassDOT that impacts a majority of transportation projects um, across the Commonwealth. So next slide. In uh, 2013, um, MassDOT passed a healthy transportation policy, and it required that all transportation projects increase biking, walking, and transit options. Um, it applied to both state DOT projects as well as any local municipal projects seeking state um, or federal funding, which is a lot um, of where the funding comes from for local projects. So it's both municipal projects and state projects. And as a result, um, our engineering department put out a design directive um, calling for um, design minimums uh, focused on accommodations for people walking and biking. Um, in 2017 to 2018, we embarked on a policy review um, to, to analyze its effectiveness and its impact. And as a result, in 2020, we released new design criteria to ensure that people of all ages and abilities are afforded the opportunity for safe travel regardless of mode. Um, so next slide. So I wanna illustrate a couple examples, um, starting with biking actually, and then talking about um, transit and walking. Um, but where, we're, where we've come and where we are and where we're going is, um, you know, up until 2020, you know, a minimum bicycle requirement was a five foot shoulder. Um, and then you see images like you do on the left. In 2020, our new design criteria um, takes best practices, new design guidance, um, and safety really front and center and, and really requiring different facilities for people biking based on speed, based on vehicular volumes, based on context. Um, and then defining kind of what those minimums are. And you'll see those exhibited on the right with buffered bike lanes, side paths, separated bike lanes um, in all different contexts of rural, suburban, and, and urban, but less so urban, suburban, rural is more really about densi density and land use and context of how people are moving in those spaces. Next slide. So one of the big things that we did um, as of 2020 is that we updated the pedestrian criteria and we also have an all new transit criteria. Um, and this is um, forcing designers, project proponents, municipalities, the state to really make sure that we're asking ourselves, how are we accommodating all people when we're thinking about our roadways? Moving from kind of an auto-centric approach to say, okay, how do we best use this space? and making sure that we're not just thinking about along the corridor, but we're thinking across the corridor. And so um, we really increased the minimums required for um, crosswalks and safe crossings to account for a lot of the factors that uh, Corey and others mentioned about where people cross and how people cross and making sure that we're accommodating um, more and safe crossings um, on, our, on our roadways. Next slide. So this is just one example of what we've done, um, and it's just the minimums. And so at the same time, we've, over the years, are putting out a lot more new design guidance for planning and design um, to really, you know, an image in the center is about protected intersections to really um, be able to change, you know, how people move, where there's the most exposure with turning movements. Um, we just released a new roundabout um, design guide, which really gets at, you know, safety and really about, um, you know, slower, safer speeds um, at intersections, again, with the goal of reducing that exposure um, and making sure people can all, you know, move safely through spaces. Next slide. Um, one of the big keys of all of this work is rolling out a lot of trainings. Um, rolling out trainings all across um, the Commonwealth. We have a number of trainings we're rolling out this month through Bay State Roads that, you know, people, anyone on this call could sign up for. 
um, to really start learning more about this new design criteria, learning about new guidance, uh, looking at case studies. Um, and this is something that we all, you know, have a responsibility to do to, you know, to raise awareness um, and provide trainings and opportunities for people at all levels, local, regional, and state um, to learn because this, this, the world of design and street design is evolving incredibly fast. Um, and it's only going to continue to do so to make sure that um, we're designing um, safety with everyone in mind. Next slide. So this is just one example of um, dozens of initiatives that we have uh, going on. In 2018, we released a strategic highway safety plan. In 2019, a statewide bicycle plan and a statewide pedestrian plan. And they touch on a number of initiatives and strategies um, that we're working um, to put into action. Next slide. So the pedestrian vision is that all people in Massachusetts will have a safe, comfortable, and convenient option to walk for short trips and looking to eliminate pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries while also increasing the percentage of short trips made by walking. And when we talk about short trips, it's in recognition that we're not saying, okay, everyone should walk everywhere all the time. Um, there are long trips that, you know, are not feasible or convenient uh, to make by walking. But we do know that the majority of trips in Massachusetts are short trips, and the majority of trips are also non-commute trips. It's your everyday short trip um, that we're focused on um, through the implementation of this plan. Next slide. One of the key parts of the plans um, and through all the work that we're doing um, is these principles of valuing people walking and their travel needs, especially the most vulnerable, prioritizing improvements um, that proactively addresses gaps and barriers, and then also making sure that we're leading um, and supporting local municipalities to do the same. Again, moving away from you know decades of auto-centric um, focused work and really thinking multimodally. Next slide. So I won't get into all of these, um, but if you go onto mass.gov, you can read through the pedestrian plan um, and read a lot more about these six um, initiatives. And I wanna highlight a few more things that um, we have going on in this, in this work. Next slide. So one of the things um, in all of this work is that partnership is key. So at MassDOT, um, there's a lot of things um, that where we directly impact, you know, the, the safety of people walking. Um, but 80% of municipal roadways are, 80% uh, of roadways are owned by local municipalities. And so partnership is really key when we're talking about the built environment. Next slide. So one program um, that's been around since 2016 is the Complete Streets Funding Program. Um, five years ago, when there was only a dozen communities with Complete Streets policies, we now have 229 approved policies. Um, really statewide, as you can see on this map. Um, we have another 198 communities that have prioritization plans to improve their built environment and infrastructure. Um, and we've given out 161 um, capital uh, grants. Next slide. So the Complete Streets program has been really popular, um, but then also, um, Mary, you asked about changing trends. On our mob mascot mobility dashboard, you can actually look month to month and see the change in bicycle and pedestrian activity statewide by municipality. And the darker blue is greater than 50% increase. And we saw it increase tremendously right in the spring when everything shut down, um, but it stayed consistent. This is actually in October when you know, more places were opening up and schools, and we still saw a tremendous amount of activity statewide. And so in response to um, changing trends, um, the increase in walking and biking, the popularity and the demand needed for complete streets um, funding. We launched the um, Shared Streets and Spaces grant program. The so next slide. So as Stacy mentioned, um, we launched a program. It, it was originally a $5 million program that's turned into a $20 million program thanks to the Baker Polito administration that's gonna run through May. Um, I would encourage everyone, if your community hasn't participated, we still have one more round of applications um, that are due at the end of February. Um, and we have funding available to support, um, to support work in your communities. Um, and it's a, a rapid way to, to see things implemented. 
Next slide. This is just a couple pictures of improvements we've seen within months um, to improve safety. And we talked about lighting. Um, lighting is an eligible expense. Um, and we've seen some communities who have applied for grants and been awarded to just put in lighting to be able to address also um, needs to improve visibility um, of people walking as well as um, you know the on the ground um, changes. Next slide. So I want to finish um, with two things that are happening. Um, one is that we launched the speed management to prevent serious injuries and fatalities project. In all of those statewide plans, speed is a very common theme. And so we launched um, this project um, to address the fact that speed increases the likelihood of being involved in a crash, as well as the severity of crashes um, on our roadways. Next slide. And as it's already been touched upon, um, it's been a huge issue um, during COVID. It was already an issue long before COVID. It's just um, because of the significant increase in speeding and fatalities. Um, fortunately, it's becoming more of just a mainstream you know, issue, a known issue that we all need to address. Next slide. One of the core principles um, that we've all touched on in different ways is um, taking a safe systems approach um, through this project and acknowledging that we have to plan for human error um, and design knowing people will make mistakes, but when they do, we have the ability to lessen the potential that it is fatal. This is a really critical thing um, that it's about safer speeds. Sometimes that means slower speeds and traffic calming, and sometimes that also means making sure that in, on higher speed roadways, we have really safe separated um, facilities. And then when we get to intersections or when that exposure increases, that we realize safer speeds um, for all. So my next last slide is that something else coming up is that um, in addition to looking at where crashes are occurring, we are also in this kind of safe systems approach looking at risk factors to try to prevent serious injuries and fatalities. So in addition to looking at crash hotspots and where crashes are occurring, also taking comprehensive data to say, now that you know, we know what those risk factors are, what are roadways where there's a higher risk or potential and making sure. Um, and so we're looking forward to kind of diving into this data that's gonna to start to become available this year um, and turn that into projects um, in the future that we can really start to um, prevent crashes um, in addition to addressing where crashes are occurring. So thank you, um, and thank you for all that you're doing, and um, thanks for having me here today. Thank you, Jackie. Great presentation. I'm so glad to see the work that's being done on lighting. We know that three out of every four pedestrians who is killed is killed in darkness. So uh, a huge element there uh, along with speeding. Uh, so I will tell you uh, that we have uh, about 90 people still on this webinar, which is terrific. And we do have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna ask our panel if you mind, don't mind staying around for another five or 10 minutes. We can extend a bit so that we can get some of these questions answered, but let's try to do it in kind of a lightning round because we have about 10 questions uh, that I wanna get to. So our first one is the IIHS reported in 2010 that a significant number of pedestrians are killed on highways attempting to cross the road. Have you seen that in your territory? And if so, what do you attribute uh, the cause to? So Corey or Stacy, maybe you have some perspective on that. I know that in Massachusetts over the past year, we've had a number of pedestrians killed on our highways. Uh, I don't have any uh, knowledge of any data on it, but I did kind of one of the crashes that I did pass over, uh, again, I was trying to keep it more with uh, local uh, things that we would see. Uh, one of the crash types is uh, on highways, uh, one of the 13 crash types. And usually a lot of times that involves uh, someone's car breaking down on the highway and then them exiting their car trying to get across the highway uh, in that regard. Uh, so one of the things, best thing you can do uh, is stay in your vehicle. Don't exit your vehicle uh, if your car breaks down and wait for help to come. You can't put your hazards on. Uh, I, I know there's still a risk that you may get rear-ended or something like that, especially if it's a high-speed roadway, but it's you have some protection in that regard uh, rather than just being you versus motor vehicle. 
Yeah, I would agree. Exactly. And I would agree quickly with Corey. Uh, many times the way that the data is ca characterized, at least uh, when we're looking through it around pedestrians, is if um, they're hit on it, like just as Corey mentioned, if they're out of their car because their car has been disabled in some way, um, or even um, in some cases there are issues around railroad tracks and other things. So uh, I don't have any specific information about an example where I can really think of somebody that was crossing a major highway that was hit in the, in the near in the near past. So. I think that a couple of those cases in Massachusetts recently have been just what you mentioned, Corey, which is someone who's leaving their vehicle to, to walk for help uh, and ends up being struck. Um, a question from the National Transportation Safety Board folks who are on the call. Regarding turning crashes, to what extent do they occur at intersections where right turns on red lights are permitted? Uh, Stacy, I don't know if you want to take a stab at that one. Um, well, that does depend on um, a bit about how the signals are set up in terms of, of traffic signals and whether or not they're concurrent versus exclusive, meaning do you have to, is it an all cross where everybody can cross at once, um, all legs are stopped, or if it's um, uh, concurrent where there's some crossing with movement. Um, right, turn on, right turns on red is um, something that pedestrians are particularly concerned about. Um, some of the ways to prevent or dis discourage um, or pr prevent some crashes is to use something called a leading pedestrian interval, which is where pedestrians have a few seconds to get out into the crosswalk um, before the light turns um, turns green for that traffic that's moving um, at the same direction as they and so that they can actually get into the roadway. Um, usually that's only used with red when red turn on right turns on red are prohibited. Um, but uh, so but it is a way of, of, of helping to, to kind of get drivers aware that people are actually in the roadway and needing to cross uh, with the walk signal. Uh, another question regarding multiple road users. Um, a question regarding ending a shared use path and tying it into a bicycle only facility at an intersection. How do we deal with merging two different facilities together at the corner of an intersection to two different crossings be made? Jackie, I don't know if you want to uh, take on that question or if you have any thoughts on that question. Yeah, I um, you know, it is always context specific, but there's a lot of um, design solutions for those those exact cases um, where we're seeing on street bike facilities turn into side paths and side paths turn into to separated facilities. Um, I don't I don't have an ability to pull up a picture, but I think um, near Forest Hills in Boston is a great example where you have on street and off street facilities and you actually have two different crossings across the intersection. So you have two separated crosswalks, one for people walking, one for people biking, um, which are just simple ways to just make it very clear where people should be and and respect people you know walking respect people biking um, and provide that separation and make it safer for people driving as well we also in arlington uh at one of our crossings uh lake street at the minivan bike trail which is i believe the largest used bike trail in the country um we redesigned that intersection after having many conflicts with pedestrians and bicyclists and one of the things in that design was that as they're approaching the intersection where we put in a full traffic signal at the bike path, we split the pedestrians and the bicyclists so that the cyclists have their own lanes in both directions and pedestrians have their own lanes in both directions to cross Lake Street. Again, good advice. Um, we have a comment from Meg Robertson who says the driver should also be looking left or right when turning before moving into the turn. And again, that whole element of scanning the road and, and really calculating some human error and human uh, fallibility into uh, what we do on the roadways. Um, another question, what is the percentage of pedestrian crossing in error? What is the percentage of driver error in these incidents? And uh, Stacy, I don't know if that's something that you have some insight into. Um, you know, one of the other interesting elements that emerges in the AAA study is the presence of alcohol, both in drivers and in pedestrians contributing to crashes. But again, the question is percentage of pedestrian crossing in error um, versus driver. Yeah, I don't have any details on specifics uh, uh, that I'd be able to comment on 
for those percentages? I don't know if Corey does or. No, I don't have any either. Uh, it would just only be anecdotal. Uh, Maybe Jeff does. I'm not. Um, no, actually, I don't either. But <clears throat> but I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that the um, the the question is um, perfectly stated. Um, because it's because if a pedestrian makes a mistake, the pedestrian gets hurt. It's the and but when a driver makes a mistake, that's a bigger problem. Um, and it's it's the same thing. You know, a lot of times when we talk about um, distractions um, and and the impact on pedestrians, the first the first questions will will come up is you know what's the well so are pedestrians um, more distracted and that's the problem that we're dealing with. And while sure, I think pedestrians probably are more distracted. I mean, I, I walk, you know, around with my, carrying my cell phone, but the pedestrian being distracted isn't doesn't cause um, the injury and the hurt. It's the driver who is distracted um, that's causing the injury and the hurt. So I mean, I think that that's it's important to kind of recognize that when you're having this conversation. I also um, just want to add to that one thing, two things. One is um, on that note about kind of vulnerability. We we talk about. We often say like people are walking or biking are vulnerable when really it's not inherently like right like walking isn't inherently a, a, a dangerous thing to do it's that conditions are un, unsafe you know for people walking um and this is where the question about speed really comes into play too um you know just like the impact of um you know we know people are going to make mistakes we have to do everything we can to lessen people making mistakes and we don't want anyone distracted or drunk um but this is why the safe speeds, especially at intersections, and making sure that there's some ability to do traffic coming as people are approaching, so that um, so that if there is a conflict, we have the ability to lessen lessen the the risk that's posed. Um, there's no reason why you know we have 40 mile per hour roadways um, in dense areas where people are walking. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it, it's really a, a great point, Jackie. And the AAA study found that even one mile an hour of an increase in speed can make a difference in terms of injuries. So, you know, and certainly five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, you know, much more so a dramatic increase. So, so true. So uh, I have the last question comment here, uh, which comes from Richard Granels. And Richard says that pedestrians, drivers, and cyclists on phones and or listening to music in both ears are major issues. Uh, and to your point, Jackie, by the way, absolutely, you know, we're having this conversation because we want all road users to be safer and bigger to each other and more deferential to each other to keep everybody safe. But let's talk about that technical question of uh, earbuds being used by, by walkers, cyclists, and drivers. Jeff, you have anything you want to contribute there? Um, well, you, you broke up just a little bit, so I'm not sure exactly uh, what you're saying. Sorry about that. But um, I mean, I think that that goes back to what we were just talking about: is um, dis distractions are a problem for everyone. Um, this is this is a this is and this isn't a problem for even even on the roads. I mean, distractions are a problem in the household when people are having dinner and they're distracted by their devices. It is it is ubiquitous in almost everything that we do. Um, but it, but the one one spot where it is it is dangerous and can cause harm is when we are either behind the wheel or on our uh, on our bikes or we're walking around. Um, so it's it's something that everybody needs to be be aware of in every circumstance, no doubt. Uh, if I could also add to that, uh, Mary, uh, there are laws uh, for impeded operation in Massachusetts. Uh, I can't speak for any, if there's any other areas uh, in the Northeast that are in on this. But uh, technically, if you have headphones on or earbuds in, if you have them in both of your ears, that's a violation uh, as, a, as an operator of a motor vehicle. And you could probably take that a step further uh, in Mass General Laws is that basically all cyclists have to follow the same regulations as a motor vehicle when they're on the roadway. So technically, it would be a violation as well for a cyclist to uh, have both have earbuds in in both ears. It doesn't apply to pedestrians. So maybe that's something that needs to go over more in education uh, in the licensing process or and keeping people updated. As I know, I've pulled over a couple of people uh, who had headphones in and they were totally unaware that they're not allowed to have it. They're like, oh well, I'm listening to uh, you know, an audio book, but the fact that I remind them that it took me three blocks and basically pulling up next to you before you notice that I was behind you to pull you over shows that you're not really noticing what's going on. Anybody else want to add to the conversation? 
Jackie. I just want to add one more thing I didn't um, that I didn't have a chance to touch on, but I would just point out that um, thanks to COVID, um, actually one of a, a silver lining is that one of the things is that we've um, had a lot more creativity and ability to to raise awareness and do a lot more with driver education. So our new our, the learners permit first time drivers um, test is is online and there's a lot of new resources and as part of that process that you go through um, a lot more um, learning about uh, safety um, for all users, um, both for parents and guardians as well as first time drivers. Um, and there's a new portal um, on the RMV um, website. So I just wanted to point that out as well. That's and I just wanted to course. add, you know, to echo a little bit about what Jeff and, and both Corey and Jeff were saying is just that, you know, we all need to look out for each other when we're out there on the roads. Um, there, everybody has responsibility to be safe. Um, yes, pedestrians are more vulnerable because we're not sitting within a within a vehicle. Um, and yes, we pedest pedestrians have as much responsibility as others. But it's really important to, that all of us, when we're out there, to stay safe. We all just need to be aware, to be looking out for each other, and and to make it safe for everybody. Well said, Stacy. And as I always say in interviews that I do, have the same manners out on the roadways that you would have if you were at a dinner party. You wouldn't push or shove someone or try to scramble around them to get to the buffet table. You would, uh, you would be courteous and you would be. I would uh, love to go to a dinner food. party right about now, wouldn't everybody? <laughs> <laughs> you don't get in the way of me in the buffet table, though. It's. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And regarding the earbuds, by the way, there are a couple of bills in the legislature uh, around just that issue in terms of uh, cyclists and uh, and walkers uh, and earbuds. So uh, I just want to uh, say that this has been a terrific conversation. You are so right. The goal is to keep everybody, whether you're walking, whether you're riding a bike, whether you're in a car, to keep everybody safer on our roadways. And that means paying attention. It means slowing down. Uh, it means being especially vigilant and not being distracted, really focusing on the roadways. So uh, this wraps up our discussion on a very important topic, and we hope you've all learned something about staying safer on the roads. I know I've learned a lot today. A big thank you to our speakers and to you, our audience. Thank you for all the great questions and for your interest and participation. A big thank you, as always, to Mark Shieldrop for his great wizardry with the slides behind the scenes. AAA Northeast Public Affairs, I'm Mary McGuire. Have a good day. And if you have to go out, buckle up and drive slowly and safely. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Bye, everybody. Shovel your sidewalks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.